This is part two of part one from last week. Last week, as you know, or may not have known, was our 35th anniversary. And we spoke a bit about the purchasing of this building. And this building was built in 1979. I said that in 1979, God built this building for me. See, so that's kind of selfish and arrogant. But it was in September of 1979 that I surrendered to come to Canada and start independent fundamental Baptist churches. And in 1991, this building was defunct. The walls were coming down. It was a total mess. No parking lot, two different color roofs, uh, no grass, no nice seats like you're sitting in, no carpet, no baptistry, changing rooms, no classrooms. It was pretty much a mess. And there were several reasons why that happened. And uh, we're thankful that the Lord in his grace and in his mercy has been gracious to our church and our church family. I believe one of the reasons that God blesses our church is that we care for others, and in particular, missionaries. Last Sunday evening, we took a $3,500 offering to send to a young missionary and his family in Israel. They have been kicked from pillar to post there from the Jewish rabbis who chased them out of town, and now they're in the Arab section. So we sent them found out how to do wiring on Monday, and we sent them the $3,500. And the time difference, of course, his pastor called me in. But before his pastor called me, he had emailed our church to say, thank you very much for your gracious gift. So you think about missionaries on the mission field. The only way that a missionary can continue on the mission field, and that is the churches back home continue to support them. A missionary should never, ever want for support for when churches take on missionaries they take it on take them on not through tithes but they take them on through what we call faith promise giving that is you trust the lord that the lord will give you and put upon your heart amount to give uh, systematically week by week or month by month and yearly to support the missionary so really the missionary should never have any financial difficulties but what happens from time to time is churches fold and when churches fold and missionaries are not able to get a job, they have to sometimes come home from the mission field. So this church, I don't know all the reasons that it folded, but it, it folded, it fell apart. And by God's grace and God's timing, we're able to purchase it in 91 and then move in in 92. And these many years now, the Lord has been gracious to us, giving us the building, giving us the land and everything that's in it. And we thank the Lord for God's people that have been faithful. We've had several congregations and that's the way it is. People move and especially in Fort McMurray, people come and they go. Uh, not many people are from Fort McMurray and so they move from time to time. So there are reasons why a church no longer sustains itself. There are reason why, reasons why pastors quit and why God's people fall away. And so we'll look, tonight I'll just reiterate a couple points and then we'll go from there. Father, we do thank you for this evening time. We thank you for this good group out this evening. And Lord, I pray that we will see tonight the importance of the functionality of a church. You said, Lord Jesus, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. A church is not a building, it's a body of believers, baptized believers. And so tonight I pray that you challenge us once again from your word as we see the importance of continuing on in the work of the Lord. Paul said, be therefore steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord bless now the preaching of your word I ask in Jesus name 
Amen. Matthew chapter 5, please. Beginning in verse number 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, where will it should be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trotted underfoot. We don't think too much about salt today, and yet Ecclesiastes says that, that the white of an egg has no taste, and so you need to salt it. Uh, back in days gone by, before there were refrigerators and ice box. I can remember, anybody ever have an ice box? And I can remember when I had a kid, was a kid, I had a kid when I was a kid, that the ice man would come down the road in the morning, uh, sometimes with a horse pulling his ice truck or in the truck, when of course horses were out of the scene, and they would bring these big blocks of ice into the house. and. You'd put them in your ice box. It wasn't a fridge, it was an ice box. And there was a pan under the ice box, and from time to time, if you forgot to empty the pan, water was all over the floor. So that ice would be there. And I remember as a kid, uh, especially in the summertime, we'd kind of go along with the, the, the ice man, and he would chop off some pieces of ice for us. And I remember the milk was so lovely, because it was fresh milk, and you'd take the top off, and get the cream off the top. And, and then one of the amazing things was, of course, chocolate milk. And then whipped cream was a big deal. But <clears throat> salt is how people preserve their food. Salt was even more valuable than gold and silver. And they traded by salt in the Middle East countries. So Jesus said, ye, are the salt of the earth. Well, what does salt do? I, I like salt, and uh, animals like to lick salt, and, uh, but I like salt. I like pretzels. I fight with it all the time. Those pretzel rods, and then potato chips, uh, salty, peanuts salty. And lately I've been on a... Uh, dairy-free chocolate uh, salt uh, ice cream in care of Eliza and Gabby that first introduced me to it. They brought it to me, and so now I'm on a kick with that. So you can actually, when you eat the ice cream, you can actually taste the salt. So if the salt has lost its savor, Jesus said it's good for nothing but to be cast down and walked under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither the men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candle stand or a candle stick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We're studying the book of Revelation on Wednesday night, so I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 1 about that candlestick. Remember the first time I taught the book of Revelation, this is the fourth time that I'm going through the book of Revelation. It's a great blessing to my heart, especially the first time I read it and realized that the Lord holds the stars in his right hand. And uh, that was such a blessing to me to realize that the stars, of course, here in chapter 1 are referring to pastors and that the Lord Jesus holds the seven stars in his right hand. And, of course, the seven stars are the seven churches that we discovered in chapter 2 and chapter number 3 of the book of Revelation. Now notice with me, if you will, beginning in verse 
number 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Those are lampstands. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one, like unto the Son of Man. That's Jesus daily when we come to church. He's here. Didn't he say where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst thereof? So he's here. He's inspecting the church. He's the inspector as he goes through his church. He's in the midst of the seven churches. And what a blessing it is to understand that he's in the midst of the seven churches. And why one like in the Son of Man clothed with a garment down, down to the foot and girded about with the paps with a golden girdle, breastplate of gold, his head and his hair white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like in the fine brass, that of course speaks of judgment. And they burned in a furnace, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice was the sound of many waters. By the way, something else we'll see Wednesday night in Revelation 11, the Big Bang. The actual Big Bang we'll see in Revelation chapter 11. And here it is. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. When I saw him, I fell on his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Our memory verse from Genesis chapter 3 says, It shall bruise thy heel, thou shalt bruise his head. Well, our Lord's heel was bruised on the cross, but yet prophetically, Satan's head will be bruised and that's of course the more deadly wound and that will be when he's cast in the lake of fire in Revelation 20 and verse number 10. And I'm looking forward to that day when he will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and burn forever and ever and ever. I am alive forevermore. Amen. Have the keys of hell and death. Now, John, pick up your quill and begin to write. This is what I want you to write. Write the things which thou hast seen, past. The things which are, that would be the church age in chapter 2 and 3. And the things which should be here after chapter 4 and following. Now, he's going to explain the mystery of the seven stars and the seven candlesticks. The mystery of the seven stars are the, that which thou saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars, are the angels or the ministers of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. I said, number one, the reason that churches fold is because of lack of participation. And look quickly, Revelation or Hebrews 10, I'll just give you the points quickly that we looked at last time, we won't labor them again but my participation I'm so thankful you came back tonight <laughs> I'm thankful you came back tonight and uh, not everybody comes to all the services all the services are different we don't preach the same sermon Sunday morning Sunday night and Wednesday night they're different and uh, so Paul said how important it is for you to participate verse 24 of Hebrews 10 says and let us consider one another to provoke on the love and good works not forsaking and we said last week that word forsaking is the same word that Jesus uttered on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So just like Jesus was, was forsaken on the cross by all mankind, God pulled down the curtain of heaven and from 12 to three in the afternoon, Jesus suffered <clears throat> unbelievable pain and suffering on that cross for those three hours. And then of course, lifted up his head and, Gave up the ghost. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as a man of some of us, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So when God's people quit participating and coming to church, you can mark it down, the church will fall. Secondly, our family, and we looked at Micah, and so let's just look at Luke 
for a moment, but we looked at Micah chapter 7 and verse 6, that the enemies will be those of our own family. That's unbelievable to think about that. But the salt will lose its savor, and the light will refuse to shine because of family members that stop family members from going to church. Luke 14 and verse 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. For which of you intending to build a tower sit it not down first and count the cost while he has sufficient to finish it? Thus happily after he had laid the foundation. People are watching you. Your family members are watching you. Your loved ones are watching you. Your acquaintances are watching you. And you're building a testimony before them by your life as a, as a Christian. Will you, will you continue? Will you stop? Will you carry on for the work of the Lord? Less happily, after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish all that beheld and began to mock him, saying, this man began to build, was not able to finish. Why? Well, look at verse 26. Jesus said to the multitudes in verse 25, multitudes were following. He said, now stop a moment. Are you sure you want to follow me? Are you sure you really want to be my disciple? Rhetorical question. But are you sure you want, to, you want to follow me? You want to be like me? You want to be conformed like me? You want people to hate you like they hate me? By the way, if they hated me, he said they'll hate you also. They didn't believe me, they won't believe you also. So will you carry on with a person you've never seen? I've never seen Jesus. I see him in the book, but I've never seen him personally. And for 42 years, by the grace of God, I've been preaching about Jesus. Peter said, whom having not seen, you love. Do you love him? As you read the word of God, you will become more in love with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 says we grow a glory at a time. Beholding in the glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. In other words, God the Holy Spirit gives us truths of God's word. If we obey that truth, he gives us more truth. If we reject that truth, then we're stagnated and we stop and we don't go on. Peter said, but grow and the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So those multitudes, Jesus, and I want you to think up for a moment. If any man, again, this is rhetorical. If any man come to me and hate not his father. That mean you hate your parents. You don't hate your parents, but... You put Jesus ahead of your parents. Your father, your mother. Well, some people would say, you know, I don't like my father. My father was a mean man. Or my mother left me. I was an orphan. Your wife is unkind, maybe. Unloving, maybe. Children. Well, you know what? I, I live for my kids. People will say, well, I'm not going to get a divorce because I'm living for my kids. Wrong reason. Don't live for your kids. Live for each other. Why? Because when the kids are gone, you'll be gone. My children, they're my life. The center of my life, they're my kids. Oh, Jesus says, if you put anything in front of him, you're making it an idol. Brothers and sisters, yea, his own life also he cannot be my disciples. So families will stop us. And then verse number 16, again in Matthew 5, says, Let your light so shine before men. Let's notice it. Let your light so shine before men. They're watching. You may not know they're watching, but they're watching. Your neighbors are watching. Your classmates are watching. Your employer is watching you. What do you mean you want Sunday off? Well, I want to honor the Lord. You want to do what? I'd like to have Sunday off, please. No, you can't have Sunday off. We need you on Sunday. You can have Tuesday off. No, I like Sunday off, please. I like Wednesday off, please. When I was in Bible college, I had, of course, had to sustain myself, so I had jobs. 
So between school and the course of the day from 7 in the morning to 11 at night, I went to school, took a full load. That means between 25 and 30 hours classes. Got out of school at 11.30 to 12.30. Went to the Oakland County Jail. Met with the prisoners that I had preached to on Friday, three times on Friday. First of all, we'd preach to the girls. They'd come out. Then we'd preach to the first-time offenders. They would come out. And then the last service, we'd have to go to the cell blocks and go where the murderers and the rapists were. And we'd preach to them. And some of them would make professions of faith in the Lord. And Monday through Friday, Friday between school and before I went to work, I would take them Bibles and devotionals, and I would meet with them and speak with them as they had questions, never with the girls, but with the men and the young offenders. And you sometimes would wonder, I wonder if that actually, they got saved. Because I'd give an invitation to come and receive Christ as their Savior, and they'd raise their hand and we'd give them Bibles. And then when I would get back the next day or two or three days, get back to the cell, and um, by the way, that's how I learned to play music before I preach. Sometimes we don't have somebody doing special music, I'll play music. And I would go to the cells and I would take my recorder, anybody know what a recorder is? And I would play music, then I would preach to those inmates. They couldn't go anywhere, so I had a captive audience. And one young man got saved, or said he got saved. And I gave him a Bible and I just kind of, after a while, you know, you kind of get I don't know if they call it a rut or what, but you just get used to giving out Bibles. And it's like you give out, here, read this. It's how to go to heaven. And it becomes mechanical. And so I came to the cell block and I said, where is, they said, oh, he got out today. I said, oh. And then another inmate said, by the way, he read his Bible all night. Wow, glory. <laughs> Not enough to, touch your heart. And so that's what we did daily. Went to the jail, then I'd go to work till 11 o'clock at night, get home and start all over again. And, and I worked for Ford Motor Company. Well, I didn't actually work for Ford Motor Company. I worked for a contractor and I drove semis. <laughs> drove a, drove a uh, Ottawa, a switcher. The semi drivers would come and they would drop their, you'd be surprised how many semi drivers don't know how to snake in a trailer. And I learned how to snake in a trailer. I'll tell you about it another time. And uh, they would drop their load in a, in a uh, called it a bullpen. And it was a coal, it was, you had to go in a coal and pick up the trailers in coal. I came home, I looked a little different than I look now because of the coal. But in between pickups, and I would drive the trailers into the plants and certain plants, and they would take the empty stuff, and I'd come bring them out and so forth. But in between, I'd read my Bible, my little New Testament. And I still have that little New Testament. I've had it recovered. And I have names of people that I've had the privilege of leading to the Lord. And the boss hated me. I didn't know that, but he hated me. I never pressed him. I never pushed him. It was nighttime, and so there was... People were gone, the shift worker, there weren't very many people there when I'd revive at, arrive at three o'clock in the afternoon. So I'd read, sit up there and read my Bible, either in my truck or somewhere in the plant. And uh, I didn't realize how much they hated me until they set me up and got me fired. So if you live right for the Lord, it's not gonna be an easy ride. Not going to be an easy life. Paul said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it's important that you have a good testimony. And the Bible says here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Your testimony is important. Look at Mark or John chapter 5. Your testimony is important. Do you have a testimony? Can people say, yeah, she, she walks with Jesus. Yeah, that's a Jesus girl. <laughs> Here's a girl that was a young, years ago there was a young girl. I don't think this could happen today. They'd probably throw out of school. 
But there was a young teenage girl who brought her Bible to school. Brought her Bible to school. And they would mock her and laugh at her. And she said to her dad one day, she said, they're laughing at me. He said, well, the next time they laugh at you, you hand the Bible and ask them to carry your Bible. But that young girl made up her mind as a teenager now, not as a young girl, eight, nine, ten years old, but as a teenager that she'd be for Jesus. And walking down the halls of that school, she carried her Bible. And the end of that story was that year of graduation, <laughs> she was the homecoming queen. <laughs> and the song that they played was Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. You have no idea how important your testimony is. Paul said we are epistles read and known of men. You may be the only Bible someone will ever read. Notice John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Verse 33 talking about John the Baptist. You know John the Baptist's ministry was six months. Six months and they cut off his head. Jesus' ministry was only three and a half years. You may not have a long ministry. I thank the Lord, 35 years in one place. 35 years in one place. And we've had many congregations. Sometimes preachers get together and they'll say, well, how many of you are running? What they're doing is they're wanting to brag on how many do you have. And I said, I'm running them out as quick as I can. <laughs> I sometimes thought we ought to have a revolving door. They can revolve in and revolve out. But I don't ever want to run anybody off. And I don't say when people leave, praise the Lord, we had a revival. They left the church. Remember this morning, we learned that Jesus has a seed that he plants. Satan has a counterfeit. So we never know who is saved or not. There's no yellow number or red tag on your back to say, oh, those, they're, they're genuine. How do you know they're genuine? Because they continue. How do you know someone's genuine? They continue. Don't tell me what it takes you to start something. Tell me what it takes to have you continue something. Verse 33. You send unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say that you might be saved. He was, watch it now. He was a burning, not a flickering light. Sometimes we flicker. <laughs> you know, a wet wick won't light. Uh, you have to have the wick from time to time trimmed. And God has to sometimes trim our lives. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and I in you. Without me you can do nothing. And then he says that sometimes he prunes uh, the vine. That means it cuts away the vine. If you know anything about trees, when I was a young man, 14 years old, I did what Horace <clears throat> Greeley said, and I went west, and I ran away from home. He said, go west, young man. I went west. And I lived with a bunch of migrant workers. They were actually gypsies. We picked cotton. I was one time a cotton picker. <laughs> picked orange. Picked grapes. did all those kinds of things. And when you think about fruit and fruit bearing in the vines, it's important to understand that irrigation is very important. I remember the Japanese people there in California. I was in a place called Lindsay, California by Bakersfield. You ever get a can of, of olives? Look on the back and it usually say Lindsay, California. And the thing that amazed me, now back then I was about 6'2". Well, back then I was probably like I am now, about 5 something. And I can remember the irrigation of these Japanese orange trees. Because they were no bigger than me and the oranges were that big. That big. So when we think about John and his being a testimony. Well, being there in California with those people, I was white and they were Spanish. 
the farmers paid me more than he paid the Spanish people. So when you think about being a testimony, red and, white, red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in the sight. People are prejudiced. And people may not like you because of your color of your skin. What color was Jesus, I wonder? Was he red? Was he yellow? Was he black? What color is Jesus? Well, we know he was a Jew, so he must have had olive skin. So you and I are to be a testimony where God puts us. And John the Baptist was a burning and a shining light. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. And then I want you to find Matthew chapter 13. This kind of goes along with this morning's message. So my participation will shut out the light and the salt of my church. My family will stop me. My testimony will stop me. But also we learned this morning four different soils. Four different soils. The wayside soil. The stony soil. The thorny soil. And the good soil. And we learned about this thorny soil. That there was a problem with it as there was with the other, the other two. The wayside, of course, there was no, no plowed field to plant the seeds. It was just like putting it on this wood here. No growth. The stone, well, there was some dirt under it, but it was no deepness of it. But then the thorns, that was a big problem. Verse 22, and also... He also that receives seeds among the thorns is he that heareth the word and here are the two problems with this kind of person. Again, they appear to be Christians. This isn't to say that people who get wrapped up in the world or get wrapped up with riches are not Christians. That is not what this is saying here. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches Choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. You can't serve two masters. Either you love the one or hate the other one. You've got to make a choice. You, can, you can't straddle the fence. Someone says, well, you're taking a stand. No, I'm just, I'm just waiting around. I'm straddling the fence. No, you must make a choice. Look in 1 John chapter 2. So the cares of the world, the deceitful riches of the world, Riches come they, and they go. Sometimes you're doing well. Sometimes you got a bunch of overtime. In fact, so many in our, our town, so many begin to buy lovely homes. Very nice homes. Between 600 and a million dollar homes. They made sure there was a suite in their basements. And they would rent out those basements for between $2,500 and $3,500 a month, and that paid for the mortgage. That's a pretty good idea. But it didn't last. Some people, they live on their overtime. Give me some overtime. I need more overtime. And you can get in trouble. The cares of the world will get you in trouble. Some of us, we become part of the CIO. Everybody I see is our O's. Because <laughs> we get wrapped up. Well, they just got a new truck. I need a new truck. They just got thus and so. So here's what John says. 1 John 2, 15, love not the world. Now we're in the world, but we're not of it. Love not the world. The world will suck you up. The world will get you down. Neither the things that are in the world. Now we live in the world, but we're not of the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You, again, you can't straddle the fence. Either you're in or you're out. Make a choice. I'm going to be in. Again, you may say, we're preaching. You're preaching to the choir. Yes, I am. Because I need it and you need it. And those who are not here, we can't help those who are not here. But you and I need to continue on keeping on for the Lord. So love not the world. John is saying this. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here it is, and this is how Eve fell. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Oh, that fruit looks pretty good. Hmm, I wonder what it tastes like. The pride of life, man, Adam would be a better man if I would just grab that fruit. Remember, Satan said to Eve, Yea, hath God said. He got her to doubt the word of God. It's not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Look at James chapter 4. James has something to say about that also. So the cares of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of it. Get too wrapped up with the world, you get in trouble. Verse 4. James 4, 4. We'll look at beginning at verse 1. From which come wars and fightings among you? God's people warring with themselves. Come they not hence of your own lust, that war in your members, your lust? Not necessarily talking about sensuality, sexual things, but lust means I have to have it right now. I, I got to have it now. Well, learn to wait. Okay, you need a vehicle? Wait on it. Need a home? What kind of home? Wait on it. And so forth. You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask amiss. Well, sometimes God answers our prayers. Sometimes he doesn't because he knows, Father knows best. You ask, verse 3, and receive not because you ask amiss. You're asking with evil desires. That she may consume upon your own lust. Now here it is. Verse 4. Now this is spiritual adultery. An adulteress is the man and woman. You adulterers, the man. And adulteress is, ladies. Know ye not that the friendship of this world is enmity with God. So what happened to this church? What happened to the people of this church? I remember the week, every Sunday, when we first started out, not every Sunday, but we'd take those, we probably had 30, 40 people at the time, and we'd go to Gregoire, and there was a bowling alley there owned by some Lutheran people, and they were very gracious to us. They let us bring cassettes in. Anybody know what a cassette is? <laughs> and we listened to Christian mu music, and we played five pin and 10 pin and so forth, and it, it was a great time. And one weekend, it was Halloween weekend. By the way, my neighbor's at it again. Ah! Walk out the house and she's got these goblins and stuff there. And they always blow away, but she gets new ones. So this morning we pulled out of the driveway. There was only one goblin there. Scary looking person. Looks like they didn't eat very well. We came home from church. There was a whole bunch of them. Halloween. I remember the first Halloween in Fort McMurray. I went to the bank and they were all dressed up like creatures and stuff. I said, these Canadian people are nuts. <laughs> remember, I was a Yankee. But they were all, I said, what is going on here? This is a bank I'm going to. So this week of Halloween, we were bowling and a bunch of people began to come in, and usually it was exclusively for our church, but others would come sometimes, not very many. But this whole group of people came in. One had a red pajamas. He was the devil, I guess. And they were all dressed in costumes and stuff. I thought, what in the world is this all about? So the gentleman who was the owner, who was also, by the way, a funeral director, 
on the bowling alley and he was and bombed people. I have another story about that when I was a little boy, but I won't tell you. I had a friend, his dad was a mortician. Would you like to come for supper? No. We'd like you to come for supper. Okay, I'm coming. First time I went, these doors were open and there was a bunch of open caskets. I ran up the stairs. I didn't go back for any more supper. It was good, but I wasn't going back. So these people, I said to the guy, I said, who, who are those people? He said, oh, that's the pastor of Thickwood Baptist Church. I said, what? Maybe that's another reason. They got too close to the world. It's like the little boy that fell out of the bed. His mom said, what happened? He said, I got too close to where I got in. When you get in, beloved, you got to get in. You know what I'm talking about? Get in and get out and out for Jesus. You can't have the world and that little bit of Jesus. It's either all or none. Know you not that the friendship of the world, yes, we want to win the loss to the Lord, but you can't make them your friends because they will pull you down. You'll mark it down because you will compromise because you want to be like one of them. Is the enmity with God. Whosoever therefore be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. And then number five. Look at, if you will, Psalms 116. My participation or lack thereof, my family, my testimony or lack thereof. Someone says the only thing a Christian can lose is your testimony. Do a hundred good things and do one bad thing and they'll never forget about it. Psalms 116. You know, I, every day in the world, I read five chapters from the book of Psalms. Every day with my other readings, but I read five chapters from Psalms. And I'm either reading from Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, or Song of Solomon. I'm reading through those books. I go, I finish the 31 chapters of Proverbs. I read the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes, and then I end up with the love chapter, chapter 8. Remember Paul, or Paul, Solomon wrote a book about rules, Proverbs, wrote a book about regret, Ecclesiastes, and wrote a book about romance, Song of Solomon. You want to keep your marriage sweet? Read Song of Solomon from time to time. But I tell you what, the Psalms, I'm stuck right now and 26 through chapter 30, those five. This morning I finally moved on to 31 through 35. But it's so good. It's so good when I get in Psalms. I just, I just mark it all over the place. It's so good. Every emotion that you ever will have, you'll find it in the book of Psalms to be an encouragement to you. Verse six, chapter 16, verse 1. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Look at 103. I'm sorry, chapter 40. Chapter 40. My memories <laughs> you work for a company and they say to you, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> if you do sales, usually they'll say that. What have you done for me lately? You're as good as your last deal. That's why I think a lot of people in the sales business get themselves in trouble either with gambling or alcohol or other things. So my memory will keep me on for the Lord. Psalms 40. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the Mari clay, set my foot upon a rock. Wise man builds his house upon a rock. That's Jesus. Foolish man upon the sand. When the rains descend, the floods come, the wind blows, the house built on the sand will fall. 
The Bible says great was that fall. But a house that builds on a rock, it's going to stand. He had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto the Lord, unto our God. Many shall see it, there's your testimony, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. They'll see your life. Try not to complain to your relatives. Try not to complain to your friends when you're having a hard time. Tell it to Jesus. Well, I just don't know why the Lord is doing this to me. You think they're ever going to get saved? Don't tell them. Yes, we have hard times. We have difficult times. And a just man falls seven times, but he gets back up. Don't complain to your loved ones. A young man went to China as a missionary. And he was translating the Bible with a Chinese man. And for three years, he was translating the New Testament with this Chinese man, and he finished it. And the young man said, you know, I'm not going to say anything to him. I'm just going to be a silent witness. And when we finish the translation, I'll ask him if he wants to be a Christian. And when he finished, he said to the Chinese man, You've been with me for three years. We've finished now this translation of the Bible in Chinese. I think it's Mandarin. Wouldn't you like to be a Christian? And the Chinese man said, oh no. Oh no. I would not want to be a Christian. And the missionary said, why is that? He said, because I've watched you for three years. Every time your mission check was short, you complained. Every time it was hard going, you complained. No, I don't think I want to be a Christian. And that broke the missionary's heart, true story. And the missionary wept and said, would you forgive me? But I am a Christian. And I'm sorry that I have forgotten how good God has been to me. And the Chinese man said, well, I guess I'll watch you a little bit further. So when you think about the memories, what God has done for you in the past will keep you keeping on when you recall and remember. Look at Psalms 34. This is one of my wife's favorite psalms. By the way, you, do you have a memory verse? Or sorry, do you have a, a life's verse? Is there a verse in the Bible in particular that has spoken to your heart? And it's your life verse. Do you have that? Here's my wife's life verse. Psalms 34, verse 1. I'll tell you when we get to it. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Here's the verse. I sought the Lord. And he heard me. And delivered me. From all my fears. I sought the Lord. And he heard me. And delivered me from all my fears. They looked upon him and were lightened. And their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him. And save him of all his troubles. What's God doing for you now? Look at Psalms 91. What's the Lord doing for you right now? Yeah, thank the Lord for the past, but anything new happening in your life? I sometimes bring old Bibles home. I have one now. And I'll go through the Bible. It's 1981, 82, and thereabouts. And I was in my preaching Bible. And I noticed something different about my Bible. Now, I usually change Bibles every several months. I don't mean I get a different version. I mean I get a newer Bible. Because I, I write on them. Do you write on your Bible? You ought to write on it. When you read your Bible, you ought to have a pen in your hand. Not a pen that's going to leak through the pages, but you ought to have a pen there. And when God speaks to your heart, I put the date and I put the word glory. G L O R Y asterisk. 
Because God spoke to my heart. And sometimes when I'm reading my Bible, God doesn't speak to my heart. I don't read it just to get messages out of it. I don't do that. I read it for God to speak to my heart. And sometimes I read it and nothing happens. I read it and nothing, no zingers are happening. No loud noise coming from heaven. And that's when God can trust you with the silence. Sometimes people come to church, when they first come to church, it's all excitement and it's so wonderful and people get excited and so forth. And, and uh, remember when you first got saved? You tithe. What's this? I want to get, but what's this tithing? I want to tithe. You have a Bible Institute? Can I, can I come to the Bible Institute? Absolutely. You have Wednesday night? Can I come Wednesday Yeah, you can come Wednesday night. Sunday, you have Sunday night too? Can I come Sunday night? So excited. But then things happen, whatever they might be. Everybody has excuses. Well, that preacher, you know, he just... Well, those people, you know, they were... They didn't even shake my hand. Can't do it now, but they didn't shake my hand. I didn't feel very welcomed in that church. They weren't very friendly. You have no idea what's going in people's lives. You ever go up to someone and you say good morning? Or they come by and they say, I'm good, how are you? And you haven't said anything. They're not listening. But you have no idea what's going through people's lives. You can't say, now let's all smile when your heart is breaking. And you have no idea where people are coming from. They're all different. We're all at different stages of our walk with the Lord. Some are babes, some remain babes. They remain babes because they do not obey what God gives them so they can grow more mature. That's why 1 John chapter 2 talks about children, young men and fathers. We usually don't come out of that children thing. <laughs> I like to give things to the little kids, cookies, guns, knives, grenades, stuff like that. That was funny. I like to give them cookies. So today, one of those little kids that I give cookies to, he'll, he, I, he they will be anonymous. <laughs> I gave him cookies. In fact, I gave him a few cookies. So it's a, we know it's a he. Who is it? Who is it? So he came walking in. He had a bag of something. I said, can I have one? No. <laughs> That's what they do. They're kids. That's what they do. It's all mine. This is all my cookies. All this area here, mine. Don't touch it. What's God doing for you lately? Where are you today than where you were last year? It's a different world. It's a different world. Last week we'd have had a big cake. We'd have brought out the albums and you could say, oh, good pastor, look at he had hair. <laughs> People kill me. We have an overhead thing. People say, or video. Wow, you were so young. Yeah, you were so young too one day. Wow, you look different. Yeah. <laughs> the memories of the Lord. Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge. I'll notice all the M's. My refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Look at 103. Psalms 103. Man, I could just go through the Psalms, and I do every day, and maybe I encourage you to join me. Psalms 103. Bless the Lord. When's the last time you blessed the Lord? Lord, thank you. Hey, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning. Lord, thank you for this illness. 
Lord, thank you for this broken heart. I feel how you, you must have felt. Lord, they don't love me and they didn't love you. I, I understand that. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Let's name some of them. Who forgiveth all thy inequities. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. He forgives us of our sin. He forgets all about it. He buries your sin in the deepest sea. What's the deepest sea in the Pacific? You could take the Mount Everest and bury it in, the, in, the, in Guam. Forget the name of that trench right now. Mariana Trench. And two more miles before you get to the top of the water. That's how deep it is. And he buries my sins and the deepest sea. He's written my name in the Lamb's book of life, never to be blotted out. That blesses my heart. Healeth all thy diseases. I have verses in the Bible that I underscore, I mentioned this morning. Illnesses that I have or my family has or things that are in my family and I, I'll, I'll put their names there and I'll put what I'm looking for there. Looking for God to do. And then when it happens, I can say, praise the Lord. So forget... Don't forget what he's doing for you now. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Let's think of where you'd be without the Lord. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. That's my life verse, Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew the strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. You didn't know he had wings, do you? Sometimes he'll snuff your life. Sometimes he'll, he'll dash your dreams. Sometimes he'll break up your life because he wants you to rise above it. Run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. Those are the stages of life. Young person, you're flying. Middle age, you're running. Old age, you're trying to walk. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy. Revelation 22, as I close. Will it stop your light from shining, your salt from wasting, my participation, my family, my testimony or lack thereof, the cares of the world that sucks you in, it sucked me in years ago. 19 years old, I surrendered my life to the Lord to preach. And then I got to making money. I know what it's like. Got to making money, lots of money. When we were kids, my mom had 10 children. My father died after 10 children. Two died of the boys. She was a waitress. We had nothing. Nothing. Sometimes we'd have pasta with butter. Some days we'd have pasta with oil. Some days we'd have pasta with spaghetti sauce. Someday my little mother, man, I wish I had a recipe, would make homemade bread. Ooh, my goodness. Sometimes she'd make apple strudel. My little mama. But we were poor. And then the devil got a hold of my heart. He said, how'd you like to make money? And I'm, we made money. In fact, just before I surrendered, 1978, to come back to the Lord, we were selling our $80,000 home and building a $100,000 home. I think those are the right numbers, dear.
satisfied, but dissatisfied in my soul. The Bible says, better not to vow a vow than to vow a vow and defer not to pay it. And I'd given my life to the Lord, but I took it back. And I, if you ever had an orange and squeeze it in your hand, I squeezed the world. Had a lot of pair of shoes, a lot of shoes. Lots of pair of shoes, I should say. Lots of watches, I like watches. And my wife and I married. And we lost everything in one day. And I thought I lost her. I was at work, she was home with our little poodle and our brand new trailer caught fire, burnt to the ground. We had nothing. Newlyweds, the paper, the caption, the paper, I don't know, we may still have it. Young family loses all in fire. And people get so wrapped up with things that they forget about eternity. You can have all you want to here and you need things, of course you need things. But you know, eternal things are much better. A few weeks ago, one of our memories was, verses was 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. Look down at things that are seen, but things that are not seen. For things that are seen are temporal, things that are not seen are eternal. Now look with me in the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. Don't forget your future, beloved. What he's going to do. Verse 12, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Blessed are they that do his commandment, verse 14, that they may have right to the tree of life that, that, and may enter in through the gates under the city. Verse 17. Why do we have an altar call at church? People come forward to pray. I haven't done it in a while since this virus business. But here's why we have an altar call. You go fishing, do you bring in the fish? Bring it in. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that hear it say, come. So the bride, we're the bride, those of us who are saved are the bride. Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Let him that heareth come, and let him that thirst come, and whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. Verse 20. He which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Last prayer in the Bible. Amen. Even so, come. Lord Jesus, shall we stand together? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Heads are bowed, bowed and eyes are closed. Thickwood Baptist Church went out of business in 1991, went out of business. Emmanuel Baptist Church took over. In almost 30 years, God has graced us with our own building. Can meet when we want to meet. Can come in without... Uh, from without the weather, have air conditioning, furnaces, hot water heater, dishwasher, nice cupboards, comfortable nursery, comfortable chairs, all from the Lord. Thank the Lord 
But will we, if the Lord tarries, will we last another five years, 10 years, 20 years? I won't be here in 20 years. But I know where I will be. I'll be with the Lord. So as we close this October Sunday night, preacher, God spoke to my heart this evening about my participation, my family, my testimony, my memories, what God has done for me in the past, what he's doing for me now, what he's going to do for me in the future. God spoke to my heart this evening. Would you pray for me that I'll keep on keeping on? Pray for me tonight. That I'll stay in the fight. I'll stay in the battle. That I'll be faithful. Pray for me. My hands up with yours. And you may take them down. Why does Emmanuel Baptist Church exist? Because he died. Shed his blood. Was buried. Rose again victoriously. Ascended back into heaven. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Coming again. And with power and great glory. Are you ready for him? Has there been a day in your life when you recognized, like me, that you were a sinner and lost, in need of a Savior? Maybe this October evening, when the uplifted heart to heaven, an uplifted hand that I would see visible. Preacher, I'm not a Christian. If the Lord came today, I'd miss heaven. I don't want to miss heaven. I'm not sure if I die today, I'd go to heaven. I have some doubts. Is there someone like that? Preacher, remember me in closing prayer. I'm not sure. I don't have that peace with God that I need to have. Pray for me. Is there someone like that? Remember me in closing prayer. Remember me. I see that hand, thank you. I see that hand, thank you. I see that hand, thank you. Someone else, include me in that preacher. Maybe as a little boy or a little girl, you prayed a little prayer, but it wasn't from your heart. You wanted to please your parents or your Sunday school teacher, but it wasn't sincere. Preacher, I heard you mention three hands. I need to raise my hand and I, I need to be saved. I need to know for sure I'm going to heaven. Would you pray for me, preacher? Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Yes, I see that. Thank you. And Father, we thank you so much for perfect and pure salvation. We thank you have a book in heaven. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And everybody whose names are in that book, they get to get in. And everybody whose names are not in that book, they're not getting, getting in. We have to make reservations before we die. If we die, it's too late. It's appointed unto man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. These who've raised their heart to heaven say, I'm not sure. May tonight we be able to take a Bible and show them from the Bible how they can be sure. And then, Lord, so many, so many are running scared. They go into the schools and they're bombarded with propaganda. The airways are full. People are confused. And, Lord, you're not the God of confusion. You're not the author of confusion. That comes from the devil. So Lord, undergird us tonight and strengthen us tonight in our resolve to be faithful. Oh God, that we will hear you say one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. But Lord, we must be servants and we must be faithful. Help us to make that choice and that decision. Get us home safely. And Lord, may we read our Bible tomorrow. May we get on our face tomorrow before you and let you guide us and direct us. Major decisions need to be made. 
Surgeries need to be performed this month. Lives need to be changed and transformed. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night and thank you for coming.